The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa, uh, another edition of our Sensemaker in Residence series for the month of January called The Bridge with our very own homegrown, uh, homegrown sense maker, Evan McMullen. Uh, this is part two of the series, and this is on embodied practice, bridging mind and world. So we're here for 90 minutes in total. I'm gonna hand it over to Evan in a moment. Uh, just throw your um, uh, questions in the chat. If you have any uh, questions, I'll call on you and mute yourself. If you don't wanna be on YouTube, uh, just indicate that and I will read it on your behalf. So that being said, welcome back to the store, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, I've got another short little presentation today and this is where we start to get some real payoff today, the material today. So we had to get some of the sort of uh, theoretical framework out there. Um, and I promise there was some good reason for that. So today's presentation is a little bit shorter and uh, hopefully a bit sweeter um, than what we've done in the past couple sessions of the bridge. And so I'm really excited to uh, to get to the uh, the questions and to see what people make of this and how that how it might apply to um, what you're interested in terms of of your own practices. So um, and how these framings can help inform those sorts of practices. So I'm going to go over this this presentation fairly quickly. I'll, I'll make an attempt to uh, to go through it in a in a nice. Uh, a nice rhythm and then um, so just be thinking of how some of the ideas that are presented today might affect your own relationship to various sorts of practice and I'm, I'm really excited to see where that conversation goes so i'm going to go ahead and start sharing screen for this first uh portion so let me just get that going and we'll go ahead and get started with that um zoom where are you share screen and share screen cool <clears throat> All right, so um, where's my start button? There we go, cool. So um, this session, Deep Dives uh, session two is on embodied practice, bridging mind and world. And I mean mind here in a peculiar sense, the sense that I used it um, earlier in the, uh, in the uh, presentation last week. So we'll, we'll do a brief review of some of the stuff we've gone over first. So the first session of the bridge focused on a couple different concepts. One was indexicality. So this is the idea that words in general don't really contain much in the way of meaning. They point at meaning. Indexicality meaning like as the index finger points at things. Um, and that there's maybe some very rare exceptions to this, maybe words in the realm of say pure mathematics could be defined to actually mean things, but even that I'm personally not so sure about. Um, we also touched on in the first session, the importance of what I called phenomenological self-inquiry or abbreviate PSI. And so what I mean by this is this is the most general, generalized indexical pointer at the sort of techniques of knowledge quests in the realm of the subjective of what we directly experience ourselves. And again, in the first session, we talked about what constitutes the features of a valid knowledge quest, which is held in common by, for example, science with respect to the objective external world, as well as many of the ancient wisdom traditions with respect to a similar quest for knowledge of the internal world. Um, we also touched on the importance of Sangha. Um, this is again a, a Buddhist term, but this is a generalized pointer at the third component of valid knowledge quests, which is to say, not just doing a certain investigation, but checking in with other people um, <clears throat> who have also done the same steps, the same investigation um, in order to refine our understanding and also refine the steps in the investigation for the next round, the next generation. Um, so then in the second uh, session of the bridge or the first of the Sense Maker in Residence series, we got into something that I'm calling virtualism here. Um, now, so virtualism was the topic of the neurophilosophy session last week. And so I'm not gonna go into too much review here, um, but I wanted to point out some of the reasons why I brought it up, why it's not just another bit of cool, you know, intellectual, uh, you know, candy, but why it actually has some significant utility for us. 
us. And so virtualism helps us with confusion between what I have called the world, which is the phenomenological subjective world of our experience, and what I have called reality, which is the thing that physicists study. Um, and so this sort of confusion is at the root, I think, of a lot of the issues that many people have with traditions that have specialized in phenomenological self-inquiry. And when I say many people, I'm primarily referring to the sort of people who reached um, Keegan stage four, and we went over the Keegan stages in the first bridge session as well, through a, um, a bridge from three to four involving education or practice in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the sort of STEM fields, which according to people like David Chapman, and I, I do agree with him on this topic, that that's the most available bridge that still exists in the American or Western cultural world. Um, and then we also, um, as I sort of just alluded to, we discussed the Keegan stage model of adult human development as one useful map. And so this bridge that I'm centering this session and this, this bridge project on is the bridge from Keegan stage four to Keegan stage five. There are other stages that are relevant to bridge. That's simply not what I'm focusing on for this series. So I wanna go into a little bit more detail about why we went into virtualism in the last session. So I'm gonna call this virtualism as a deconfuser. So why would we even spend time on neurophilosophy or virtualism specifically? Well, there's certain utility to having what I think of as like a translation layer or a, a meta language between different traditions of phenomenological self-investigation, as well as between phenomenological self-investigation traditions and science as a, another wisdom or knowledge quest, which has a different domain of applicability. And so um, I also think just as a note, it's most likely that any valid science of psychology will need something like virtualism as part of its basic theoretical framework. And I apologize if I'm stepping on any sacred cows, but there's been a fairly interesting evolution of psychology from being essentially a collection of just so stories, um, which is the state of things around the time of say Freud and the other early psychologists to where it is now, which is a sort of interesting hybrid of a bunch of different, and I might say, mutually incompatible theoretical frameworks. So as far as how to ground that, I would suggest something like virtualism, though that's a bit of a side note for this conversation. Um, also, I think that many of the confusions surrounding the statements made by traditions and practitioners of those traditions of phenomenological self-inquiry are the result of equivocation. And this is usually unintentional. So what do I mean by equivocation? Well, it's when we use the same word to refer to two different things. So we're using the same word and in different contexts indexically pointing at two different things. So um, it's really hard to tell as an example here, when somebody talks about things like the world or reality, what are they actually pointing at? Um, in my take on virtualism, these two words have very distinct meanings um, indexically. And so we'll go into that in, in the next uh, slide here. So. To review my usage of this term virtualism, virtualism sort of is this premise that the entire phenomenal world, everything you can experience, see, hear, taste, touch, smell, feel, all that good stuff is in fact being dreamed by a mind, the way that idealism would have it. Um, this mind is not identical to what we experience as the phenomenological or phenomenal self. This mind is being generated by the brain of a social primate, which exists in a reality which mind does not and cannot have direct access to. Mind can only interact with reality through indirect signals that are transmitted into our nervous system by our nerves. So um, to review, and I, I simplified this a bit, I, I recall from the feedback last time, some people um, had not been exposed to the idea of graphs and hypergraphs and quantum physics. So we don't really need to bring that terminology with us for this particular discussion. We can just define reality as whatever the thing is that's being studied and described by modern physics. That's what I mean when I say reality. Uh, mind is this emergent functional or computational process of a fairly well-defined subset of reality through interacting with a fairly well-defined systemic interface to the rest of reality. So to make that a little, um, a little bit uh, clearer, what I'm saying is that the mind is a thing that's embedded in reality. Your mind doesn't exist on some different plane from whatever physics is describing. 
Um, the mind is, is generated by an emergent process whereby your nervous system is interacting with the rest of reality through a fairly well-defined systemic interface. In this case, your nerves, your, your, your peripheral and, uh, and sensory nerves. Cool. So then when I say a world or a phenomenal world, what do I mean? I mean essentially a virtual reality or a virtuality generated as part of the evolved emergent function of mind, as I've defined it above, which is likely to, uh, and it's likely been evolved in order for the organism to be able to predict the results of actions taken by the organism in whose body the mind is being generated. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about the self. So the self is the avatar of the organism whose body is generating the mind, which is always situated in some phenomenal world. So we have this virtuality that's generated by our capital M minds. And what we think of and relate to as ourselves, as the self, is the avatar of the organism whose mind is generating our phenomenal world, which is everything we ever experience. So what does this get us? Well, that, this section is focused on embodied practice. So we wanna see what does virtualism get us as a guide or an adjunct to practice um, in phenomenological self-inquiry and beyond. So I think virtualism precise, provides us a decently precise languaging which allows us to indexically point more precisely to what we mean when we're discussing the sort of things that are often mentioned in the traditions that, uh, that have good techniques for PSI, for phenomenological self-investigation or self-inquiry, things like, like Buddhism, things like Hinduism, things like forms of Sufi mysticism or Christian mysticism or indigenous wisdom traditions. All of these like to talk about a lot of interesting things and frameworks and we I think can help disambiguate what they're talking about by applying the lens of virtualism. And how does this help? Well, it helps us to notice the connections, the areas of consonants, as well as the areas of divergence between different traditional frameworks and practices for phenomenological self-inquiry. So why is this good? Because, well, most of us are in what I kind of like to think of a roll your own adventure with respect to our own path. Very few of us are following a traditionalist version of any of those paths I just mentioned. Um, and even those of us who maybe are tend to be mixing and matching. One of the phrases you hear around the STOA a lot is an ecology of practices that people will be drawing from different places and traditions. We're all creating our own ecologies of practices and this can help us figure out how to relate these practices and their fruits to each other. Um, so strictly traditionalist paths, uh, one reason why most of us don't tend to practice them is because they're quite unsuited for modern people in modern societies with modern values. Most of these paths um, have sort of medieval or archaic or pre-modern values, especially surrounding things like the role of authority, the role of the state, um, the, the relations between genders, et cetera, that most of us would find to be somewhat abhorrent if we were to wholesale adopt that tradition and its value system. And so uh, this also doesn't mean though that there aren't some frameworks or paths relatively traditional that are better suited for us than others. And so this way of looking at things through the lens of virtualism, I think can help us figure out which ones might be best suited for each of us. And when I say us, I mean each one of us as individuals, not that I think there's an ideal path for, um, for everyone here, but that we can each figure out our ideal path or set of paths um, and that one of the tools in our toolbox for doing so could be this view that I'm calling virtualism. So I wanna just run through a toy example here within Buddhisms. Um, so if people have uh, happened to catch uh, Charlie and Jared's uh, sessions on the Stoa called the Evolving Ground, um, they mention uh, something that's quite important. There are very different frameworks, methods, approaches, views within different Buddhisms. And so they focus on the distinction between what they call Sutra or Tantra. You might call it Sutrayana or Tantrayana, the vehicle of Sutra, the vehicle of Tantra. And so I, I wanna just take this as an example and say, well, what does the lens of virtualism have to show us about this? Well, Sutra focuses primarily on renunciation and Tantra focuses primarily on transformation and engagement with the world. So let's see what virtualism might have to say about that. So from the perspective of virtualism, we might notice that Sutrayana focuses on renunciation as a way to reduce the need to predict, and prediction is the primary purpose of the brain's world model in the first place, an inherently unpredictable capital R reality in the sense that I've been using it in virtualism. So for example, living in a monastery with a very strict schedule, abstaining from things like sex, violence, theft, intoxicants, et cetera, 
all of these serve to make most aspects of reality, which one interfaces with, much more predictable than they would be in a normal everyday life. So they're less prone to sudden and explosive change. Now, what does this get a practitioner? Well, this allows a practitioner to focus their phenomenological self-inquiry on the self and the mind that generates the self in a fairly controlled environment, which can be really useful if you find yourself habitually distracted, or as we often say around these parts, limbically hijacked from your phenomenological self-inquiry by the extremely chaotic reality in which you are embedded, and thus the chaotic effects on your phenomenal world caused by the chaos in reality. So um, let's contrast that then to Tantra. So again, using the perspective of virtualism, we could say that Tantra does not try to minimize predictive error by changing the external circumstances to promote regularity through renunciation, but that it seeks to use the inherent unpredictability and intensity of reality as experienced through the phenomenological or phenomenal world as a way into understanding the, the fundamental non-duality of emptiness and form. This is uh, one of the main purposes or points of Tantra. So we use that very unpredictable unpredictability that Sutra tries to avoid by renunciation um, actually as an object of phenomenological inquiry itself in order to understand the non-duality of emptiness and form within the tantric Buddhist traditions. So um, the fact that it doesn't go in so much for renunciation and promotes engagement with intense and unpredictable states of the world or the world model, the phenomenological world, is part of why it is thought of in Buddhist circles as less safe or perhaps even dangerous. And so this lack of relative safety should, though, I think, be evaluated in the context of the rest of one's life because, well, Sutra sounds really cool, but are most of us trying to sign up for a path of strict renunciation? Yeah. So um, I want to combine some of the ideas from the previous sessions now, virtualism and an indexicality um, as a way towards a meta language for practice. So what do I mean by this? Well. Let's take some examples here. Some of the traditions of phenomenological self-inquiry hold that the self is real. Like there's a higher self, there's a soul. It's a very real enduring thing. Some like Buddhism or most forms of Buddhism hold that there actually is no self and that any idea of self is some sort of illusion. So in this case, it's useful to figure out the definition of real. What is the word real trying to indexically point at um, to figure out what the claim actually is? And also the definition of self. What is the word self indexically pointing at? I've tried to be very clear in my presentation here by what I'm trying to point at as self. It's the avatar of the being whose mind is generating the virtual reality that's located inside the virtual reality that we identify with and experience as ourselves. That's what I mean by self. Um, and so indexicality, even just bearing that in mind, continually returning to the notion of indexicality helps us uh, build the reflex or the habit to try to disambiguate what people are pointing at when they use words, especially words that are, as I've talked about before, semantically overloaded, meaning that they have multiple mutually incompatible meanings that are often associated with them and that they're often used to point at. Um, so similarly, if we move on to uh, the fact that some traditions hold that the world or reality is real, very real, some that it's an illusion or a dream. Well, I think this confusion can often be resolved by noticing that reality, in the sense that I use it when I describe virtualism, is real. There is a real thing out there that's being studied by physicists. And also that the world, meaning the phenomenological world that we can interact with, is a virtuality or a dream generated by one's mind. And you can even look at the science on this and uh, notice that, in fact, um, the very same parts of our brain that are responsible for generating our experience while dreaming are doing the same thing while we're awake. We're always dreaming. It's just a question of whether that dream is hooked up to reality through the, the, the sensory nerves or whether it's just being generated entirely within the mind. Um, so we can then often use the perspective of virtualism to achieve a sort of compatibility layer or a sort of meta language between the wisdom of one's practice traditions and the wisdom generated by science by realizing that they're often using the same words to indexically point at very different things. And that this can be fundamentally okay as long as you can successfully dereference the pointer. As long as you can see the moon that the finger is pointing at, we become much less concerned with what the finger actually looks like. So um, 
I've talked before in some of the other settings on the STOA and in adjacent spaces about something I call whole being sense making. And I wanted to sort of tie this in to what we're talking about today. So um, the little phrase I use, the title of this slide, embodiment and enheartment via phenomenological self-inquiry can lead to whole being sense making. So what do I mean by this and why am I even talking about this? Well, Virtualism suggests that most of what the mind does is not accessible to the self. Um, and for some much more detailed explanation of what I mean when I say that, I would highly recommend that people check out both the uh, writings as well as the talk on the STOA that was done by, uh, by Frank this past weekend. Um, Frank, uh, highly, highly, I, I don't remember how to say his name, but Frank, um, has, has a much more detailed presentation of, of, of what exactly I might mean by that. Um, and I, I definitely recommend it for people who want a, a, another person's take on what I'm calling virtualism here. And thank you, David, for putting that in the chat. Um, his work is excellent. So um, the mind also, I, uh, as, as far as we go to the next point here, the mind, meaning the thing which is generating our virtuality and our experience of self is distributed not just in the brain, but throughout the nervous system, and in fact, beyond the nervous system in terms of the dynamics of the nervous system's interactions with what I call reality, the entire world. And by, or I, I see now I'm even slipping up here, reality, meaning the thing that physicists study that we are embedded in, that thing, well, its interactions with our nervous system are part of the essential generator for the mind and the self. So most of us though, tends to think of ourselves as the mind, and, and, and not necessarily even the mind that I'm using in the sense that I'm using that word in my virtualism spiel, but, but you know, the intellect, the, the internal dialogue, the, the experience of us thinking about things. Most of us tend to be very heavily identified with our thoughts primarily. So this leads to predictable over-reliance on what is commonly thought of as thinking to the exclusion of things like what Gendelin calls the, the felt sense or people call intuition or body wisdom or body being, right? Um, and, and I think that this is very much to the detriment of sense-making ability and choice-making ability when acting effectively in the world. And so I analogize this over-reliance as being like having an entire toolkit and yet all I do is I take out that, the screwdriver and in addition to driving screws with it, I also use it as a hammer, a chisel and a knife in addition to using it to drive screws when I've got this whole excellent toolkit just sitting right here. So phenomenological self-inquiry can help to resolve some of these above confusions over time. The more people do phenomenological self-inquiry, whether from one of the meditative traditions or other forms of phenomenological self-inquiry, they tend to converge on a focus at, that things like embodiment and things like listening to the heart or the gut tend to take on an increasing importance and an increasing level of trust in the way that they live their lives. That's certainly been the case for me. Um, and it's also important to note here, I added this quote from Aristotle, which I love. Um, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. Right. So a lot of times people get caught up by wanting a really quick payoff from all this stuff. Well, no, we, we have to form new habits. And this way of relating to the self as primarily the thinker of thoughts is one of the most ingrained habits in most of us. And it will take quite some time to break. We have to repeatedly do that, break that habit. Um, and yeah, so re retraining habits takes time. It takes some sense of space or spaciousness and the ability to play. So. Um, I want to discuss whole being sense making as I'm describing it as a sort of superpower. Um, so learning to use all of these tools in the toolbox of our being in a fluid and contextually appropriate way vastly levels up the capabilities and the anti-fragility of humans, of, of any given human. I, I've never seen somebody in my own experience who is really engaged with this process of phenomenological self-inquiry, who's framed things in terms of appreciating whole being sense-making, the wisdom of integrating what pe people often refer to as the body sense, the heart sense, and the mind sense into a fluid field, that just tends to make people really leveled up in terms of their abilities to meet their goals and priorities and to act in more compassionate and loving and, and you know, dare I say, um, more, more productive ways in the world. Um, it's a pretty consistent phenomenon. So 
the reason that I spent the time on virtualism and on indexicality is because I think that framing the problem here leads to a lot less wasted time. Um, I certainly myself would have been super grateful to find those framings in one place and linked in this way when I started working on this stuff because I, I spent a lot of time going down what I now consider to be dead ends. And uh, so this is just my attempt to offer something that might hopefully be useful to even a few people in terms of uh, short circuiting some of those dead ends and blind alleys that we all uh, inevitably encounter uh, through the path of phenomenological self-inquiry and the, the, the broader path of moving along the stages of our development as human adults. Um, and I wanna bring up here this word metis again. I used it in the first session. I might've used it in the uh, first session of the, the Sensemaker in Residence series as well. Metis is an ancient Greek word, which doesn't have a great translation. You'll often find it as, uh, as translated as cunning or trickery, but that is an extraordinarily limited translation of metis that doesn't capture the full meaning of it in ancient Greek at all. For example, Odysseus was said to be one of the humans who exhibited the highest degree of metis. And he was uh, a great warrior for sure, but he was one who won his battles through cunning, not just trickery, but the ability to, um, to really, you know, like see the lay of the land in a way that was faster than thinking about it and be able to act really quickly on an accurate understanding of things. You could say that because Odysseus had cultivated such a high degree of metis, his decision loop ran much faster than those of his opponents. And he was able to get inside of their tempo, get inside of their timing and their decision loop. And this is the kind of tactical cunning and trickery that metis is referring to. But it's not just that. Metis was deeply, um, deeply connected in the works of Homer um, and the other early Greek philosophers with the art of navigation, with the skills required to be an excellent kubernator, right? Which um, is the root of cybernetics, um, among other things. It, it, it's it, it's the, the steerer or navigator, the helmsman of a ship. And so Metis was what you needed in order to be able to pilot a ship through treacherous or rough waters during a storm, okay? And so the reason again that I mentioned Metis in the, in the context of what I'm calling whole being sense making is because anybody who's ever had to pilot a vehicle through tough environmental connections, uh, con conditions, even if it wasn't a ship, imagine, you know, like I live in Michigan and so I'm driving at night and, and it's, it's a blizzard and I've got to keep it on the road and not hit people. Well, like that skill set. I cannot be intellectualizing this. I cannot be thinking thoughts about it. Metis is associated in the Greek literature of philosophy, uh, riffing off of Homer with an incredibly intense present moment awareness where it combines the entire sensory field along with the sense of intuition and the wisdom of the body to allow people to navigate through these sorts of treacherous territory. Yeah, somebody just said flow state in the uh, chat. Metis is very much associated with the ability to call on a flow state on demand. Metis is also associated though, and this is an interesting wrinkle, with deception, both the perpetration of deception on others and seeing through others' attempts to deceive you. Um, and so this is actually an interesting reason that I associate Metis with uh, the Keegan stage five or fluid mode or what David Chapman calls the complete stance because trickery and the seeing through of trickery requires and gives you practice in fluidity with respect to your frames or lenses or perspectives or models. It's a sort of meta systematic mode of relating to the self and the world and reality. You can't think too hard about which model is the right one. You have to rely on your intuition in the moment based on a, that intense present moment awareness of metis to guide you through the stormy seas. And so I would just say that Metis and the Greek literature on this is actually a really useful place to look, um, to uh, experience some examples that are deeply rooted in our Western cultural heritage um, for the full and skillful use of the whole mind or being, or what again, I refer to as whole being sense-making. I use the word sense-making because it's common around these parts, but I really think Metis is a really great term for what you might call whole being sense-making and choice-making. So, um, as usual, I've added some recommended resources for people that want to explore uh, some of the topics I went over today. Um, Zen Body Being by Peter Ralston. Um, Frank, I already mentioned the Emotional Body and the Stoa Talk by Laura Bond on emotional effective effector patterns will give you some really interesting um, windows into how to harness the uh, emotional and physiological aspects of uh, the body and sense making. Um, 
The Gesture of Awareness by Charles Gnud is an excellent work on this topic. As always, I recommend The uh, Science of Enlightenment by Shenzhen Young, and then the uh, neurophilosophical works of uh, Francisco Varela are also excellent on related topics. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead, stop the presentation, and I'm very curious to see what questions have come up for people during the course of this. So, uh, Peter? Awesome, thanks, man. Uh, I wish I had a pause button so I could pause you uh, every now and again as I could read one of those slides. Uh, so I'll, I'll warm up with a question, uh, and I got to ask this one: um, the the idea of uh, you know a meta troll or a sacred troll, how it relates to metas or meta or whatever you call it, metas and um, Keegan Five. Wow. So um, I'm going to try and not spend the whole rest of the session talking about this because I really, really kind of want to. Um, so meta trolls, right? So there's a real um, commonality between what we might refer to as the trickster archetype and trolling, right? Now, we had an interesting post-session discussion several months ago on the STOA that I think, Peter, you might've been there for some of um, about that sort of knife's edge between the trickster archetype, especially like the positive uh, teacher versions of the trickster, and then the troll as maybe a negatively valenced description of a very similar sort of move and walking that knife's edge maybe is what the meta troll does. So within that sort of framing, I would say that um, it's really interesting to look at the connection between Metis, which was the name of a Greek Titan. So like the first generation of Greek gods that were displaced by Zeus and the Olympians, as well as the name of the um, skill or the faculty that she was an embodiment of. Um, so uh, if we go back to the Greek mythology, what's very interesting is to find out that, um, so Metis, this Titan, and Metis could also be translated, it's often translated as cunning, like I mentioned, or trickery, but it's also translated as wisdom. Metis was the Titaness of wisdom. And so the result of the coupling, the sexual coupling between Zeus and Metis um, was that he got a really bad headache and out from his headache popped the goddess Athena, who also was a goddess of, among other things, wisdom, right? And so in the Greek mythology, Athena then is, is, is a goddess of wisdom, but the sort of wisdom that a trickster has, Metis, that's the kind of wisdom she was the goddess of, not the sort of wisdom of old gray bearded people that have read way too much stuff, whatever the heck I'm turning into, no. She was the goddess of practical wisdom, right? Um, she was also the goddess of techne, um, which meant like crafting or crafts. But what is the hybrid of metis and techne, of craft and the practical wisdom of cunning? Well, it's what we now refer to as technology, right? Um, so Athena was the goddess of technology. So you have this trickster archetype along with the sort of like crafts archetype. And this leads to a hybrid technologist god or goddess, which Athena was. Athena was famous among other things for um, one of her, uh, one of her, the people who she championed was Eric Thonius, the founder of Athens, who was the inventor, mythologically speaking, of among other things, silver coinage, monetary systems, and written writing, like the actual alphabet. Now, again, this is apocryphal, mytho mythological, et cetera, but the mythology there provides us a really interesting lens into the relationship between Metis and the trickster archetype and, and, and trolling as a perhaps a slightly more negatively valenced em emotional uh, take on, on, on the trickster archetype. But I really think these are all intimately bound together. And the difference between a troll, a meta troll, and a trickster primarily lies in the eye of the beholder. And perhaps you could say that the meta troll or the meta trickster has a slightly greater metis with respect to being able to manipulate the eye of that beholder. Mm. And a quick follow-up question. So this, this trickster meta troll that has good metis game, uh, what's his role of getting people on the bridge? So there are the kinds of tricks which leave everybody laughing at you, right? These tricks tend to be the sort of kind of tricks that I don't really like much. I don't like playing them on people and I don't like being subjected to them myself. And so I try to use whatever metis I have to avoid those situations. On the other hand, there are the kind of tricks that at the moment you are tricked and you see through it, you are laughing with the trickster and they are laughing with you because it's in support of, of life, of growth. Um, it comes from a place of compassion, if that makes sense, right? So I think that's, to me, the, the, the crucial thing here is 
is, is that that we really, um, you know, when we talk about tricking people onto bridges, well, that's that's a really dicey topic, right? And you know, if we wanted to go into some of the uh, the guru figures from the history of tantric Buddhism, there there's a bit of this going on sometimes there. But I think the most important thing is that that in order to do metis ethically, it has to be grounded in a deep abiding appreciation for all of life. And I want to pull up pull one of Forrest Landry's ideas out of here out in here and say that you know it has to be done from a place of love love as that which enables choice so if you're tricking people you're being a trickster a troll a meta troll in order to enable their greater sphere of choice good job acting from compassion if you are tricking people or trolling them in ways that constrain their choice then that's as close as I think we can get to a definition of evil right and that's the knife edge stuff um Cool. So uh, I'm going to take in Rob Hart because his uh, question's related. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Evan. This was another great installment. Um, so my question is around practicing for Metis. Um, and I mean, you could see that there are people that develop Metis within a domain. And then if they leave that domain, they don't really have it. Um, so maybe it's not Metis, it's just mastery in the domain. Um, but could you point to the opposite to practices or maybe attributes of practices that allow you to kind of bring that metis beyond the container where like mastering something within that domain will prepare you for other ones? Yeah, so I hate to just harp on this all the time, but this is why I emphasize phenomenological self-inquiry so heavily. I think that that is a form of a meta skill, right? Because being able to see the workings of your own mind and self more clearly will pay dividends in every area of human activity that I'm familiar with. Um, similarly, other forms of phenomenological self-inquiry that aren't so focused necessarily internally on the mind, but are focused on our direct sensory awareness, whether it's visual, auditory, bodily, whatever, right? There's almost no situation in which more precise and fluid sensory awareness and better ability to relate and integrate our senses does not also pay dividends you know so like my day job i'm a i'm a you know computer programmer mechatronics engineer type and i literally joking not joking tell my coworkers and friends that my superpower is just that i pay attention to things right just the ability to notice those things in my visual field which are relevant and that is very much a skill that can be trained if you look at a lot of the practices in American indigenous wisdom traditions, both say within the Toltec shamanism, as well as in Native American tracker, like Northern Native American tracker traditions, there are ways of engaging with your senses, um, which are deeply potent and transfer all the way over into computer programming. Like I would say that working through the practices in Tom Brown Jr.'s um, Wilderness Survival Guides and Guides to Living with the Earth, have significantly made me a better debugger of computer code. And that's not something that I would have expected going into it. Any follow-up, Rob? Yeah, uh, getting down into phenomenological self-inquiry a little bit more um, technically maybe. Um, I'll just speak from my personal experience. I tend to get lost in the like wide array of different practices that are kind of on offer and I, I think that probably consistency with one particular practice would be more valuable even if it wasn't the most superior practice rather than like switching between practices so often that I didn't nail one down. Um, but like I, I have this kind of stuck feeling of like if I commit too much to one and it doesn't seem to be working then I want to kind of like pull out of it. Um, I guess what would resolve that for me, my, what my question is, is like um, do you know of a particular practice that seems to be like really reliable for Westerners to get into PSI um, or is there too much temperament involved there? Yeah, I'm afraid that it's a bit too individual in my experience uh, working with other people and even working with the different versions of myself that exist have existed over the roughly 18 years I've been involved in this, right? So um, that being said, I can suggest something that might be a useful framing here, right? which is to, um, I like to look at sort of cycles of going deep and then going breadth first, right? Like depth first versus breadth first, right? So I'll do a survey of the practices of which I'm aware, and I will try to understand the goals of those practices, um, usually through the lens that I presented here as virtualism. Like what aspects of things 
are these practices working on, right? And you can use whatever lens is relevant to you. I, you know, virtualism is, is something I find valuable and hopefully a few of you do, but you know, whatever lens you got, use that, cool. So maybe like as an example, maybe I find that I, I, I wanna do some practice working with like my sensory modalities. So I'm gonna do some of the practices out of say some of these American traditions that, that look at, you know, the sort of things that a hunter might do to train their sight and hearing, right? And then maybe I wanna do something that is gonna help me get out of my head, right? And so I'm going to do some sort of meditation focused on a mantra or on a casina as Daniel Ingram likes to talk about, right? And then maybe I wanna do some sort of, of practice which is going to you know, expand my compassion, right? So maybe that's going to be something out of Eastern Orthodox Christianity, a very kind of prayer-based approach there, right? Or maybe it's going to be something out of Buddhism that looks like metta bhavana or something like that, right? But these are the sort of areas that I find to be relevant. And so then I'll go deep into a practice and work with it for at least several months in each of those areas, because a lot of these things, you don't get the results right away, right? You know, if you try it and you're like, oh, well, did this work over the first week? You haven't given enough, enough, enough of a shot, right? But I tend to work on cycles of around, like, say, depending on which phase of my life, either every three months or every six months. Uh, doing a sort of week where my practice is retrospection. I look at the amount of time I've spent in these practices. I look at the feelings that I have about how they've transformed my relation to myself and my abilities. And I also, and this is the important, look to the sangha, right? I look to my partner. I look to my coworkers. I look to my friends and ask them how they see these practices of having changed me. And on the basis of that, I then reevaluate. Do I want to continue with these specific practices? Do I want to tweak them? Or do I want to work on different sets of things? And I sort of iterate in roughly those sorts of cycles. Um, and I find that to be a pretty useful frame for working on this stuff. Thank you, Rob. Um, Sam, you're up next. Yeah, so... Um... Sort of, sort of, you know, continuing to think with this concept of midis, which I am finding helpful. Um, I guess I'm wondering if there are any techniques you'd recommend for like taking results one gets out of like metis and then translating them into language and stuff. So like, so for instance, like I also work as an engineer, right? And there will often be times when I notice things like intuitively where like, I just know something's gonna break or I just know that like, <laughs> that's not a good pattern. And then I'm often in a position where, you know, I have to justify that to someone else. And, you know, it feels a bit sketchy to say, oh, no, 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 just trust me. I have like a, you know, magic intuition, right? Um, and um, I guess like, just one thing I'm seeing with Metis is like, like I seem to have like developed a lot of those types of heuristics that aren't even fully consciously or linguistically available to me. And so I guess like, maybe that's, that's something I'm wondering if you could speak to like how to just like unpack that so that you yeah. can like, those results to others and you know, you don't have to like force them to trust you more than, you know, you'd be comfortable with. So that's a huge question and I, I doubt I'll be able to do full justice to it. Um, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of thoughts on that um, that have proven helpful to me. So the first one concerns this idea that you were speaking to of how do I translate this intuitive insight into language, right? Well, I think that it's actually an abuse of language in most terms to think in language. So when I refer to this sort of whole being sense making or when I refer to metis, to me, language is an input output function for the organism and, and not anything more. When we use language to think in language, like that's that's a really weird thing. Like like uh, that 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 is probably not ideal, and probably people didn't always do in history. Is is my impression. And so what I mean by this is that when we take that view of what language is, language is a as a function in your in yourself that you can plug insight into, and it spits out a serialized form of that insight that can then be read by other people. Okay. So then, um, you know, think of like a JSON serializer or deserializer, something like that. That's kind of what language is. And yet, the, when we're using our, our, our sense-making capacity of our whole being correctly, we're not dealing in one-dimensional strings. We're dealing with complex, higher-dimensional objects and manipulating those. And that's not something you can really do linguistically, 
right? So first of all, I would say noticing that separation, noticing that the richness of how we relate to things in our phenomenal world with our minds and selves is greater than the dimensionality of language. And so paying, like, like thinking of that as a distinct skill that can be trained, because I think it is one, right? The skill of taking higher dimensional representations and squashing them into a one dimensional string or maybe a two dimensional string if you're adding like inflection into it or a three dimensional object if you're adding, you know, a body language into it or whatever. But, you know, even still, you're still squashing it down to a much lower dimensionality, a much lower richness. And so thinking about how to optimize that process as a distinct process from thinking is a very useful thing to do, if that makes sense. Um, because that lets you trust your own intuition a lot more because you don't have to justify it internally verbally. And then also lets you work specifically on the skill of translating your own intuitive insight as a distinct operation that is not the same thing as thinking. And I think that's a pretty powerful way to look at it. So I don't know if you have a follow-up there, if that helps, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that does help. And that is actually like kind of like, along the lines like you know it's, it's the sort of you know parameters in which I've been thinking about right because like I do view language as like a dimensional reduction like especially you know if you're in like a sort of you know intuitive flow type state right yep. and, and so I mean maybe and I don't even know if this is like a follow-up question but then like I think like for me then um what I'm trying to figure out is like ways to like make more of the like higher dimensional process like you know, something I am aware of, right? As opposed to um, just something that is unconscious or less conscious than like, you know, linguistically formulated thought or something, but. Yeah, so as far as recommendations in that, I can't recommend the book I put in um, the recommended resources and I'll be posting the slide deck in here um, in the chat uh, before, before we're done here. So you guys can all have access to the slides, but this book Zen Body Being by Peter Ralston is like, very influenced by Zen meditation, but this guy was also a world champion martial artist and a, a wonderful teacher of martial arts and embodiment. And so he takes a lot of the sort of stuff that, that happens in Zen and Buddhist meditation and generalizes it to getting in touch with the, your whole body being. That's been a huge leveling up text that's really helped me engage with the sort of like non-linguistic ways of sense making that are still engaging the whole body as well as the mind. Um, so, so I recommend that resource really highly. Um, and then as far as the, the, the language thing, just to, another thought that occurred to me here is, is that this is one reason I emphasize indexicality so hard with, with language, because um, I've said this in some of the previous sessions, I think it's an error to assume that you speak the same language as someone else because you both speak English, right? So if I'm interacting with a, with a, a client and I'm trying to explain something, what I do first is listen a lot and try and figure out what the pointers they're using are actually referencing, right? So once I feel like I can successfully dereference their pointers, that gives me a lot of information about how I can construct my pointers so that they will be able to dereference those, if that makes sense. Yeah, all, all very helpful. And thanks for the book recommendation. Um, okay. Colty, would you like to share your thought? It wasn't a question, um, but I think it's quite good. Sure, um, hold on. Uh, yeah, as you were speaking about um, language and stuff, uh, I feel like some of the living curiosity of some of these sessions has been, okay, but what's a practice of it or, or something like that, you know? So I'm very curious about how you might teach these sort of things or explore these sorts of things with other people or other life forms um, if words weren't an option. Um, you have really beautiful metaphors and bridge a lot of wisdom. If you took words out of the equation, how might you share this with other people? So there's a couple ways I could answer that question. One is to try to dodge and say, if I didn't have spoken language, I would be able to construct referential languages by like sign language or something like that. And I actually don't think it's so much of a dodge because the first thing that, that occurred to me is things like, like dance can have a grammar all of its own, right? You know, my, my sister um, who may or may not be here today, um, 
did a, a really cool dance performance that evolved through a procedural interaction with the audience um, when she was in college. And this is um, like a really cool example of a completely nonverbal thing that's right on the border of what I think counts as language or not. I mean, you could say the procedural rules constitute a sort of grammar and the positions of the dancers and the reactions of the audience constitute sort of semantics, right? And I mean, we, we could take that analogy and run with it. So I think that, you know, um, if you take Wittgenstein's sense of a language game, you can apply that to a lot of things that we don't normally think of as language. I mean, look at the way that honeybees dance at each other, with each other, and convey directional information and uh, quality of food sources and, and, and so on. You know, um, there, there are all different ways of, of relating and communicating that are not what we normally think of as linguistic, right? I mean, you could say that the movements of visual art tend to have their own sort of like grammar and syntax or syntax and semantics. You know, you look at, say, anything from surrealism to visionary art to the, the sort of uh, traditional symbolisms and ways of doing composition of the Renaissance masters. And then you get some get somebody like Caravaggio coming in and adding, okay, so what does it mean when you take those same basic techniques and you layer on something like chiaroscuro and how does that transform the pre-existing language game? All of these suggest really interesting ways of communicating that are in some sense still indexical, but are not really at all what we think of as language in the conventional sense. Maybe that, that connects to what you were saying? Colty, did you have any? Yeah, yes. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm moving as you're talking, which is an interesting way that I have of processing information. I just have to dash back to my computer and microphone when you ask for follow-up. So I, I, I love that. And I, I, you know that I'm a dancer and movement artist and very fluid in some of the modalities that I've utilized as phenomenal self, phenomenological self-inquiry. Um, in fact, it's much easier for me to find a flow state through movement than it is through sitting meditation per se. Um, but I have those experiences. So I guess I was just curious if you were talking to the non-dancers, non-artists, non, -dancers, non you know, psychonauts in the room, and I don't mean to be uh, dismissive when I mean categorical. I just wonder what are some ins for people uh, to, mm, to sensing this as an embodied state, not just in their bodies, but, but very much a felt sense. So I feel like you're pointing towards that, and I'm even having a hard time putting words around it, but that's what I really wanted this conversation to, to kind of hold. Yeah, I really appreciate that. I mean, that that Zen Body Being book I put in the resources is is one of my favorite books ever and was hugely transformative for me. I mean, there's a really fine line between things like dance and then the internal martial arts like Tai Chi, Bagua, Xing Yi, as well as the sort of dance martial art hybrids of say capoeira, or if you look at some of the folk dances of Eastern Europe, they actually contain preserved martial forms uh, that were outlawed for the peasantry. They weren't supposed to know how to fight and yet it's all still in there. So, you know, dance as its own way of language or grammar that is not conventional language or grammar, but something super powerful. I mean, I personally will just go out on a limb and say, I don't think you can actually achieve much of what I'm calling metis here without a pretty deep level of embodied practice leading to flow states. And I do mean embodied and moving, not just standing, sitting, or lying down. I think that's key and crucial, yeah. All right, um, Alex, you had a question. If you can unmute yourself. Hey, it's Lucas here. I'm uh, just trying to find my question again. Let's see. Not finding it. Okay, I think it was something along the lines of. I just posted looking... it and uh, oh. for you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Uh, can we find a relevant container of practice to develop? <laughs> meta skills towards achieving something like mentis when we're in a game a environment or, or, or does it need to be uh more spiritually inclined does it or, or 
I, I've got a sense, I think, of what you're asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would say absolutely. Right. So, you know, um, one one job I used to have was I used to do tutoring and teach classes for uh, for the LSAT, the GMAT, the GRE and the MCAT. Right. The, the grad school admissions test broadly construed. Right. And so. I was pretty good at this and uh, my students had an unusually high level of score improvement. And the interesting thing is that the way that I achieved this was by teaching them embodiment. And I'm, I'm not even kidding. I would blow through the like Kaplan specified material and like way less time than I was supposed to spend on it. And then I would teach them techniques for embodiment, for relating to their bodies, right? Um, techniques that I had taken from things like pranayama or the Wim Hof method or various, um, you know, forms of, uh, of stuff like that that relate directly with the body and the body being, because I noticed that my students would do much better on the fully timed practice tests than they would on their actual like exams of the LSAT or the MCAT or whatever, right? And this is because when you go into a state of physiological, you know, verging on fight or flight, you go into this nervous system activation and your, you know, your, your brain is starts to have uh, blood flow directed away from the neocortex. You get extra blood flow to the skeletal muscles. Your heart rate starts spiking. You start losing fine motor control. This is like the, the end stages of what we call limbic hijack. And like, if this can just happen to you because you're stressed out about the importance of a test, well, then somewhat ironically, you're going to do much worse on that test than your mind is capable of doing. And so this is a very game A type work environment. You know, people are paying a lot of money to be taught how to do better at taking standardized tests. And yet, you know, I was able to work with people in that environment to uh, show them some of the basics of embodiment um, in a way that got that they got what they paid for. They got substantially higher test scores and I even had a waiting list for my classes as opposed to some of the other teachers offering this stuff in the area who did not because it so consistently worked for people. Just a bit of gentle guidance that, hey, this test is not just about your mind, it's about your whole being and the way your whole being is relating to this moment. Um, that sort of thing can be practiced in a wide variety of game A work and learning environments in a way that makes you more effective by the standards of game A, for sure. Any follow-up question, Lucas? Uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. What's coming to mind now is like uh, definitely, uh, definitely an effective um, tool for any kind of teaching role, uh, which I, I, I am in. And, and and so that's emphasized in 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 context, but but very relevant. So thank you. Since you're in a teaching role, I just want to offer a little brief um, addendum to what I said too. So um, somebody you might want to check out is um, Michael Smith, sometimes goes by Valentine, who's been a guest here on the Stoa. Um, he did his PhD in mathematics education, and uh, one of the interesting things he did as part of his research was actually to set up cameras, I believe, and view people's bodies, like their posture, their breathing rate, other things like that, as they were studying math and learning math. And learning, um, therefore, how to coach people, how to get their bodies into a better, more expansive, more relaxed condition, because this, he noticed, had significant effects on the efficiency of the time they spent learning and studying. So, you know, looking at your student's body language, looking at their respiration, if, if you happen to be sensitive enough to notice their heart rate, their flushing of their skin, et cetera, et cetera, all these physiological things, if you can gently guide them into more expansive and relaxed states, this is gonna pay huge dividends in their ability to use their time efficiently for the purposes of learning. Cool. Um, I asked a question about that got a bunch of plus ones, so I'll, I'll read that one. Um, and this is in service to uh, like not people inside the stoa, but people outside of the stoa. I usually find myself having a higher degree of uh, or capacity to speak many different perspectives uh, more than the people I encounter. Uh, and then I guess that you cannot be helped but being viewed or at least perceived as a trickster in that context. So the the question is, uh, if one is in Keegan uh, Keegan five, how can one not be a trickster when communicating to others who are not at that stage, either if it's out of ego or uh, out of love, aka a sacred trickster? Now that's a really interesting one. My intuitive like first response is one can't, right? 
Um, like I would say that, for example, and I've never done this, I don't have kids, but I, I, I've encountered my friends and family members raising kids. I think there's a certain element of that trickster archetype, which is gonna be necessarily the case if you're interacting with someone where you have really highly developed capacities in a certain area and they have much less developed capacities in a certain area. So like you're speaking of here, um, because this gives you an enormous amount of power in the power literacy sense um, to, to shape the way that this interaction and that their experience is going to go. You know, you have a much wider set of moves available to you in any given moment than they do. Just as a parent might have a much wider set of moves available to them in any given moment than a child. And the sort of process by which you select your moves from your available set while being aware of and seeing their available set of moves is inherently a sort of like trickstery, metacy kind of, of, of way of relating to another being, right? Um, you know, like we often have to trick or deceive children in a way that we think is for their own good. And while I think this is often, you know, done poorly, I do think that to some extent, we need to create safe containers for people to be able to grow at the edge of their capacities into their adjacent possible um, and, and sort of filter out some of the complexities of the world. And so this seems to provide some sort of guidance for those of us who, who might have these, these abilities or these perspectives like you're speaking of in terms of like taking your own degree of metis or of metatrollness or of uh, multi-perspectival ability as really being a great form of power and using that power in a responsible and compassionate way that respects the other individual's sovereignty or that respects their choice is, is, is really important, I think. And that, that's, that's the best guidance I've got there. It was interesting because if you stumble your way to the Keegan Five stage, you're like imbued with both a responsibility and a temptation, um, which is, uh, you know, an opportunity to practice one's virtue. Um, I'm curious, uh, Alyssa, you had a comment on that. Uh, I wonder if you would like to, to say it. Hi, Peter. Hi, Evan. Um, yes, I was just commenting that embodying the archetypal nature of the trickster is so powerful because the, the trickster is a psychopomp kind of being that mediator between worlds and taking people often from more conscious spaces, spaces to unconscious spaces or from one way of being to another. Uh, the trickster kind of embodying that mercurial nature doesn't uh, fit into one static rigid space. So there is power and dynamism and in some ways that responsibility of, of being able to have your feet in all of these areas and yet uh, using that in a way that is uh, virtuous, lifting up rather than maybe the more shadowy dynamics that the trickster can embody when it can turn people um, in on themselves or become trolly. So I was just sort of lifting up and amplifying that nature of the trickster, that powerful psychopomp. Yeah, I think that you know, there's an interesting way of looking at this that you're kind of gesturing at here, I think, which is that we could perhaps view the virtuous use of the trickster energy as being essentially the archetype of the teacher, right? Because a teacher is by definition a psychopomp. You're taking people from where they know to where they don't know, right? Into a new world in that sense, a new phenomenal world. And then the, the troll is the non-virtuous use of that same archetype where you are doing this not in a way that serves their greater choice and their greater capacity, but you're doing it to sort of other them and manipulate them in ways that don't serve their own goals and ends. But, but it's really the same tool. It's the same archetype. It's the same thing. It's just a question of valence, right? And so there, there's a real knife's edge between those two that, that can be tempting to walk and I mean say, look in the stories of Tibetan Vajrayana and it's full of people who are walking this knife's edge and fell one way or the other, you know? Um, Laura, um, just when you wrote that Socrates line down, Socrates was in my mind. So uh, I'll take that as a sign that do you wanna um, uh, share your comment or thought? Um, sure, I mean, yeah, I was just reminded in the symposium when um, Socrates is giving a speech on Eris, he calls in a, in a way very similar to what Alyssa was just saying, as a kind of mediator, Socrates, um, Eris mediates between the human and the divine, kind of out of this divine lack <laughs> um, and, and transmits back and forth. So I, 
yeah, maybe the trickster could be um, to kind of soften any sense of deceit. It could be a sense of uh, like a playful love, you know, of somehow arousing divine inspiration for philosophy in other people. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, deceit has such negative connotations in our world. But when you talk about Socrates and his relationship to this and, and you know, everything you just said, like, if I were going to sit down and try to teach somebody who was, you know, let's say I was going to try to teach somebody about mathematics, right? Well, like, based on my current understanding of mathematics, I don't know how I would say anything to somebody who's just knows some basic algebra that wouldn't be a lie, that they would understand, right? Because when you go up so many layers, it's so much more subtle and tricky than, than there's, there's not even the framing to express true things if all you know is say algebra one, right? So from my perspective, I have to lie to somebody in order to teach them if I'm teaching them mathematics. The same thing would be true of various things relating to computer science. You have to start out with a simplified model. And that simplified model is from the perspective of um, you know, the, the higher level and more complex models, a lie, or at least really inaccurate. And so, yeah, I, I think there's this really interesting dance that goes on with like, how do we deceive in productive and compassionate ways rather than in ways that are just to show off our own wizardry or whatever, right? You know, that's, that's the dark side of that. It's, it's, it's very important, I think, and I'm not always good at this, you know, <laughs> for the record, right? But it's, it's important to at least have the motivation to meet people where they are. You know, and I spoke earlier about the illusion that we speak the same language because we're both native English speakers, right? So it's important to listen. Often the people who are at the higher level spend most of their time talking. I think this is generally an error. People that are at the higher level should spend most of their time listening so that they can then most effectively and least deceptively point for the people at the lower levels in the service of a compassionate act of teaching. That's really cool. And then the thought emerges when you're surrounded by the others who have the same capacity, you're, you're, you're naturally kept in check because uh, you can spot each other's games. Um, Jessica. Hi, Evan. Thank you so much for this. Um, I'm wondering how you hold or what you see as the role of grief in the in acting as a bridge between rationality and the woo, or if that's something that you've given consideration to. Grief. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the sort of grief that one experiences when one First, so you go through this process of learning the beautiful descriptive power of systems and of systematic rationality. And at least for me, and I think for most people, there's, there's this sort of like wonderness that comes with it. It's like, wow, I can just like, the world makes sense now. It all fits neatly. All the blocks are dropping into place. And then, then you get to this point where you start realizing that's not actually true that you haven't found this wonderful overarching meta narrative that just makes everything line up neatly and makes sense. That there's always mystery. There's always, and mystery is a kind of positive spin off. There, there's always confusion. There's always unclarity that exists somewhere, right? Um, you know, David Chapman speaks to this in terms of nebulosity. Yes, we can see the patterns, but there's also an inherent nebulosity to things. And, and that's not something that's reducible. You can't get rid of that. Um, and we've seen this time and time again, and even fields like mathematics and physics that we just, oh shit, there's the nebulosity again. And for me at least, there was a, a pretty profound process of grief for that certainty or that, that, that feeling of the possibility of certainty. You know, like I imagine that this has happened somewhat globally within Western civilization, like when it became clear that the logical positivist project was doomed when it became clear that the attempt to ground mathematics as Russell and Whitehead tried to was doomed, um, that everything was built on this nebulous and shifting foundation. I mean, when you've spent a long portion of your life trying to get into the systematic way of relating to things and you realize it's, it's never quite gonna work, that's a process that for me at least involved a lot of grieving. You know, I, I almost think that there is a continual process of grieving for certainty. Right, you know, when you embrace uncertainty, well, there's a certain amount of grieving for certainty that I think is, I don't know if it's healthy, but for me has been a definite part of the process. Any follow-up question? 
Yeah, thank you. And I guess I also am thinking about like within my own experience, like grief as an initiatory experience that can kind of, if we don't squander the opportunity, um, be something that could be, it's, it's amazingly transformational. And so I just wanted to, yeah, kind of throw that into the mix as well. But thank you. Yeah, there's a phrase that springs to mind. I don't know exactly where I first heard it. You hear it a lot of places that we don't tend to grow unless we're forced to, right? You know, often we like to think, oh, I'm going to go out and grow. But no, usually it's growth happens to us because it becomes too painful not to grow, right? And grief in some ways, if you look at, say, these predictive coding or predictive processing models of the brain that I tend to favor, you know, grief is an enormous violation of our expectations. It's an enormous failure of prediction on our parts, you know, right? Like I may grieve over a person who was in my life and now they're dead, right? Well, like what that means in part is that my models of my world predicted that they would continue to exist in it. And in fact, they are no longer existing in it. And any sort of huge predictive error in our models like that is an immensely emotionally painful experience and is exactly like you said, is an invitation into initiation. It is a, a, a place where we can go deeper and do introspection, do phenomenological inquiry and figure out more about what was so wrong with our models. What were we were getting wrong? Did we forget memento mori? Did we forget the temporary nature of everything? You know, And really go in and experientially grapple with that predictive failure. That's one of the keys to phenomenological self-inquiry. Thank you so much. Christian, you had a question. Hey, Evan. Um, my question was about non-indexical communication, if that's the right term for it. But what I'm trying to point at is Shakti pots and energetic transmissions and other like pretty woo uh, end of the pool type of stuff. And I'm wondering if um, there's a bridge there for rationalists to, to, get, to get to some type of uh, acceptance of that without experiencing themselves. I'm just curious about your thoughts on that in general. Yeah, so um, I do think that that's a real thing. Maybe this puts me out there as a total Wumeister and some people are gonna stop paying attention to me after this, but whatever. I do think that things in the vague category of Shaktipat, energetic transmission, that sort of thing are phenomena that exist and that have great meaning and great potential for um, you know, like like for our growth and development, that's 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 part of what's out there. It's part of the territory. Whether or not our maps are adequate of it right now is a totally different story. But that's definitely a real thing to me. Um, and so I think that there are in fact ways that we are beginning to approach the ability to describe what's actually quote unquote going on there from a perspective of physical reality in a way that can sort of encompass this non-indexical communication. We can talk about things like the entrainment of bodily posture, of breathing, of heart rate, of brain states that can happen through various intersubjective practices. We can talk about the fact that even noticing the existence of these intersubjective fields is something right on the cutting edge of current Western science, but there are deep arts and technologies of working within these intersubjective fields that have been developed by various wisdom traditions that may be beyond our current ability to describe. But once you've experienced that enough times, and for me as a, you know, like scientifically trained skeptic or whatever, like you just, at a certain point, you've got to update your models and say, yeah, this is a thing that exists. I can't explain it. I have a ton of model uncertainty surrounding it, but I've experienced it enough times in a consistent enough ways with consistent enough effects to know that this is a real thing there. And I do think that such communication is in fact non-indexical in the way that you suggest that it is. This sort of communication through the broad category of things that we might call entrainment has the subjective feeling of a direct energetic communication. And I think that's not entirely wrong the same way that when you hit a tuning fork and then you hold it up next to a string that's tuned to the same note on a guitar, the string will start vibrating without any physical contact between the two pieces of metal, right? Um, that there's something analogous going on there. And I'm actually planning to spend quite a bit more time going into this in the fourth session of this residency, um, whose uh, you know, title is Bridging Science and Magic. So stay tuned for some more thoughts on that. Any follow-up question, Christian? Uh, I'll save my follow-up for session four. Great. 
questions. Um, who did this question again? I just copied and pasted it. Uh, oh, that, that was me. me. That's Kelly, yeah. Um, so yeah, this was going back to where someone was talking about, uh, oh, it was Rob's question. Um, talking about, I think like getting, I forget, something about like choosing practices to get certain results, you know? And I was wondering how you feel about what is a very common line many teachers and traditions bring with regards to self-inquiry practices that if you're doing them with a mind toward the result the promised results then you're not doing you're you know <laughs> you're not doing you're not doing the right thing or you know that's not there's you know that's not the right focus <clears throat> yeah so it's complicated and i think we need to unpack a few of the things that we're talking about here so um the first thing that comes to mind is the idea of time scales, right? So like um, in one of his books, Ken McLeod, who's an excellent Buddhist author and teacher has um, an analogy where he speaks of someone who is, uh, who, who has heard that they should get into running because it will make you feel better in your body and it will improve your physical fitness, right? And then they go running. And the first week they go and they run for, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever they can do. And actually their body is sore all over. They feel weak their energy levels are lower. They, they feel unfit and not fit, right? So um, you might say, well, crap, I was trying to get the results of feeling better and being more physically fit. And actually I've gotten the opposite. Well, that's only true if you look at it in a very narrow time scale of that first week. If you were to do running as a practice for say half an hour a day for a year, you would on average undoubtedly feel much more physically fit and better in your body than you would if you did not do that. But if you, if you have myopia with respect to time scale, then you will not notice that and you will therefore discard the practice because it's not giving you the results that you wanted. And with practices like phenomenological self-inquiry, um, especially say that the forms that are taught in most Buddhist traditions, the time scale you should be looking at to see results is more on the order of a year or two of practicing at least one hour a day before you start seeing the results you're looking for. Now, there's also the element here where we talk about, um, you know, the whole thing, like it's not about the destination, it's about the journey and that sort of thing, right? Well, that's also kind of tricky because I think on one level, no, it absolutely is about the destination. You should actually get results out of these practices because there are probably more fun things that you could be spending your time with for the most part if these practices didn't offer certain results. Now, here's the other trick to that though. Part of the effect of phenomenological self-inquiry practices is over time to refine the sort of results that you desire. In other words, to generate wisdom, right? And so you may find the practices are not giving you the exact results that you thought you would get when you first got into them, but they are helping to refine your sense of what results are even desirable. And that is in fact, an ongoing journey that's never done where it is more about the journey than the destination. So it's a complicated view that I have on these things, but hopefully that may have given some clarity or insight. Yeah, I think that's a good framing, I guess kind of on the flip side or to press a different angle, what's your, general sense about the ideas of like devotion and uh, I guess I don't know if there's a word other than devotion but you know like the commitment to the tradition based on something besides you know what I mean like there's something moreness to okay this is the thing that is what is like you know revealed to be for me or I feel called to like participate in this practice and I have now this enduring sense of commitment to it. I think there is something to devotion in that sense that you're speaking of. Like for me, you know, like I am not, I haven't followed a single standardized path, but I feel a really deep connection and resonance with specifically Vajrayana Buddhism and specifically Nyingma within that and Bon, right? And, and I've done a lot of work with people who are pretty mainstream, like intense practitioners of that over the years. And um, one thing that I find incredibly inspiring that brings out that sense of devotion for me is this idea that there is a continuous line of human beings going back to before recorded written history who have all been working to relieve the suffering of all sentient beings and who have been working 
to develop their sense of compassion, their sense of insight and of clear mindedness to be more effective at relieving suffering in the world. And this is in essence a torch that I'm now holding that has been passed from person to person since before there was such a thing as recorded history. And that that to me does inspire a deep sense of, of devotion, right? And, and, and even when I may fall down, I may lose sight of my own compassion or my own felt sense in the moment of why I'm doing stuff. Sometimes that thought of that lineage that has passed me this torch is, is called to mind spontaneously. And that helps me pick myself back up off of the ground. And just to be clear here, I don't have any official legitimate lineage in any freaking tradition to, to be talking about stuff really. But, but, but unofficially, I learn from people who learn from people who learn from people going back all the way back. And that is an incredibly deep reservoir of, of devotion and motivation and, and a sense of meaning for me, yeah. All right. Um, how about we'll land with Chris? Uh, I believe you had a question above or a statement if you'd like to share it. Chris D. Yeah, because you um, brought up intersubjectivity. And I just find it interesting that whenever I try to do the phenomenological self inquiry and doing the body practices, I feel like my own practice is elevated when I'm with other people. Um, so in what sense does phenomenological self-inquiry does include the other? Well, if we go back to my framing of virtualism, right, um, then we have the world is the phenomenological world that we inhabit and the self is the avatar of the being that's generating that world, right? One thing you notice, and everybody sort of intuitively notices whether they have virtualism as a model or not, is that this world is inhabited by other beings that seem very similar to us. And in fact, even most people who profess to be nihilists and who state that they don't believe in any such thing as meaning, still find their relationships with other human beings within their own phenomenological world to be deeply important, right? You know, there's a lot more people that claim to be nihilists than people who claim to never want to get laid, for example, as a, as a crude example, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we all find meaning in this sense of human connection, right? And even people with somewhat disordered personalities and say the dark triad or cluster B sphere, still they may have a somewhat disordered relationship to that meaning that comes from our interaction with other people, but other people are still deeply important to them, maybe for slightly different reasons. So I think that when we inspect our phenomenology deeply, we, we, we tend to find the inescapable fact that meaning is primarily derived from relationality and connection. And, and this connection is yes, with the world as a whole, with, with like the, the space we find ourselves embedded and you could talk about the connection with life in general, with the earth and so on. But being honest, most of meaning tends to come from our relationship and our relationality with others that appear to us as human beings and as similar creatures like dogs and cats that are very similar to us, animals, right? mammals and and we can expand that sphere of connection and relationality and i highly recommend that practice to come into to deeper relationship with things like insects and trees and reptiles and fish and all the other good stuff there but that being said i think that it's part of our nature that most of our meaning is derived from our relationship with other human beings any quick follow-up on that chris yeah thanks that's sort of the uh connection I was getting to as well. And thanks for pointing out Forrest Landry's work too. Thank you. Cool. And that uh, sets up next week uh, quite nicely, Evan, if uh, you want to let us know what we're in store for. Yeah. So next week um, is, is focused on the notion of communitas. And I think I subtitled it Tensegrity and Mutual Support. So Tensegrity is a word I believe coined by Bucky Fuller, or at least popularized him, that's a hybrid of tension and integrity. Um, tensional integrity. Um, and so the reason that I, I use that word and the, the title for the discussion around the implications of the bridge for community and communitas is because there is a lot of tension that arises for us in our relationality with other human beings. And yet 
that very tension is part of what helps us stay in integrity to the extent that we are able to. And like Peter was mentioning earlier, um, you know, when we are in a field of intersubjective experience with other players at around our same level, this keeps us honest. Well, honest and integrity often have very similar indexical connotations or things that they're pointing at. So I think there's something really deep to be explored about the ways that these models and this practice of phenomenological self-inquiry that we've gone into so far can inform the way that we relate to each other and to the sort of macro or super organisms that are formed when we, when we enter into stable dynamics with other human beings that you might call a sense of communita. So um, this starts the more speculative second half of this series, by the way. I'm, I'm pretty confident about most of the stuff that I've gone into uh, so far. This is a bit more experimental, the next two phases. And I'm, I'm very interested to see what other people have in terms of feedback for me in terms of that tension and integrity. So. Um, you know, don't take the next two sessions as gospel. This is this is just spitballing with you guys, making sense of the world together, and hopefully fostering a sense of community. Great. And uh, is there any post sense making uh, place you'd like to direct people towards? Yeah. So if you give me one second, I'm going to drop a link to a Discord server that I've set up to discuss the topics raised by the bridge, um, as well as a link to the slides from today um, into the uh, the chat. So feel free to check those out. The slides you can kind of consider to be freely shareable. I prefer that if you create derivative works, you credit me for the original. But um, other than that, just do what you want with them. And I'll grab the Discord link in one second. Cool. Uh, and while Evan does that, I will plug um, upcoming events. Uh, we got uh, one tomorrow, uh, our very own Tom Beekbane, uh, who's coming in. Uh, he released a book on consilience. So it's going to have a STOA a provocation. Is consilience the key to understand everything? That's tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then Transparency Tube, uh, the two founders of that project, uh, in order to track the mimetic constellations that are occurring on YouTube. It's quite a cool project. They're going to come in on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And David McFazian, are you still in the room? Do you want to plug uh, the Frank Healy event? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Frank Healy returns <laughs> next week on Saturday for part two, the final part of his series on consciousness and spirituality explained. So this ties in really nicely with what Evan was explaining today. So if you're interested in the bridge, I think you'd be interested in Frank's model of spirituality. So hope to see you there. Very cool. And uh, yeah, I'm going to post it. Yasna was on this Saturday and she actually talked about what you were just talking about, Evan, about how kind of a, you know, group practice really helps with uh, accountability and all that stuff. So that'll be on YouTube soon. So check that out. Uh, you can go to, uh, I posted in there, our website, the show.ca, the Patreon and Substack for more, more goodness. That being said, Evan, everyone, thanks for coming to the store today. <laughs>